Our next guest is Dr. Renee D. Williams. She is a minister of the gospel who is committed to building and empowering all people. She is a licensed graduate professional counselor for the state of Maryland. Her passion for a holistic approach to wellness focuses on physical health, emotional well-being, and spiritual renewal. Her professional career includes serving as the acting director for the Office of Organization Development and Engagement Department of Veterans Affairs. Prior to the VA, she led the development and implementation of national initiatives to address the needs of underserved communities for the Department of Justice. She firmly believes that we can all do things through Christ that strengthens us. Dr. Williams has a doctorate of education in organization no leadership plus a master's of public administration in criminal justice and a master's of arts in counseling psychology. In her spare time, I don't know where she finds it, uh, Dr. Williams and her husband enjoy bowling, traveling, and experiencing other cultures. Please welcome Dr. Renee Williams. Thank you all so much. I am so excited to be here. Do you all feel the power in the room? Do you know there's power at work in you? This is so amazing. You know, we all, we were asked to share a story. And so I was sharing with Tia and Ruth. Um, I flunked out of college way back when, um, 1989. And I didn't really understand how I was going to turn it around. I couldn't tell my mother. I let the male tell my mother, you know? Like, okay, well, you're not doing so well. You're on academic probation, so. I'm not paying anymore, you need to figure this out. And so I had to really understand, I had to take a step back and say, okay, what is it that God has purpose for me to do, right? So you're 19 years old, you don't really know. The reality is, it's at that point in time when you have to make some of the most profound decisions, right? You're 19 with a limited amount of information and you're entrusting your life to whomever, right? To God, to your parents. They look at you and they say, well, you're an adult. So you have to sit down and figure it out. How do you do that? What's your source? Did you give that some thought when you were 19? What was your source? Did you have friends to help you say, this is what you should do? Do you realize that some of those decisions at 19, some people are still working through at 40? Right? Because they don't know. You have to decide, you have to sit down and stop yourself and say, okay, I didn't make myself. The gifts and talents I have don't belong to me. They're really on lease. So what um, Yeti just said about being able to share, that's exactly right, that's what we're here to do. Every gift makes room for more. And the more you get, the more you give. The more you give, the more you're responsible for. So this room, this conversation, makes us all accountable to other people. So think about that. What are you going to do with this information? How are you going to impact people? Some of the things I learned from that experience was control your emotions. Understand them, be aware of them, own them, but control them. I was 19 and depressed because my boyfriend was cheating on me. <laughs> Who knew that that didn't matter, you know? But at 19, that's the world. And you don't always have somebody you can share that with. Because we didn't talk about sex much in our household. My mama said, go to school. You will go to school. So that's what you did. But understand your emotions. Had I known at 19 what I know now, I would have put more value in me to say, okay, this is one relationship that God has afforded me the opportunity to experience, but it's not the relationship. So keep it moving. The next thing I learned was keeping it moving doesn't mean you forget the past, but it definitely means you don't live in the past. We've all made mistakes. For some people who are still dealing with that bad decision at 19 that are now 40, it's okay. Own it, look in the mirror, identify it, decide what you're gonna do with it, and then do it. 
then don't stay there. Forget about that. Dust it off. When I, when I um, flunked out of school, I had to make that decision. I felt like I wasn't smart enough to go back to school, so I challenged myself. I said, okay, go to Nova and take a class. Because I love school. Because the rule in the house was, you either go to school or you go to work. And I didn't want to work. Well, not yet. So, <laughs> so I thought, I'm a good student, I can go to school. So I went back to school and I said, if I don't get an A, I will never take another course again. And I'll resign myself to whatever job I get. But I got an A. And that, that really re-inspired me. I didn't listen to the voice that was trying to keep me down because I had initially failed. Because a failure is really just another opportunity. Because who's to say life has to be the way you think it should be? If everything was good, you wouldn't understand what, was, what you were made of and what was on the inside. And the third thing I realized was you must have a plan. Not an idea, not a dream, although you can have a dream. Not even a hope. You have to have a plan. You have to be strategic about the things that you're gonna do to achieve the goal. If you have a vision, you have to write the vision down. It's not enough to just say, one day I'm going to be. Because I'm sure all of us have said that a million times. But you only really will execute on what you see. So if you don't write it down, it's just, a, it's just an illusion. It's not real. Writing it down makes it real. So remember, you can do it. There is power at work in you. Thank you. Dr. Williams, just like last night I was talking to a friend of mine, and we've been friends like since the 80s, like early 80s. And he was talking about a relationship that he had like 15 years ago. I said, Ross, you cannot grow if you do not let it go. So, you know, that's exactly what you were just saying. And I, my old saying, my favorite saying is, if you keep dragging this old stuff around, it's like, you know, there are new suitcases with wheels on them. You're dragging that old case with no wheels. So let it go. All right. But thank you. Uh, everybody's message has been so inspiring. And finally, this South Carolina native has a passion to help those in need overcome obstacles that hold them back. Angie White is CEO of Angie White Motivational Speaking with over 20 years experience in sales and marketing. Her life's work is to show men and women how they can become entrepreneurs and create better lives for themselves, whether formally educated or not. Over the years as a hardworking single mom, Angie has helped numerous people by providing hot meals, organizing fundraisers, assisting with employment applications, and assisting in local and state government access. In November 2015, Angie was diagnosed with cancer. This experience pushed her to pursue motivational speaking with more urgency and passion. She started the Angie White Consulting Firm in 2015. The firm has multiple entities under one umbrella, which includes Single Entrepreneurs of Greenville, the nonprofit Women with a Purpose, and Angie White Motivational Speaking. Angie plans to kick off a motivational speaking tour here in D.C., and then state-to-state -state engaging college students, faith communities, women's in prison, and women's shelters with words of hope, inspiration, tools, and trips, tips to create better lives. Angie has raised three children as a single mom. She divides her time between Greenville, South Carolina, and here in DC. Please welcome Miss Angie White. All right, I am so overwhelmed with all the testimonies in here. I'm just back there in tears. People have actually went through something that you can't, re you can relate to if you've been there, and I've been there. So I am a single mom, I'm a homeless. I really didn't need this here because I know my story, but I thought I'd bring it just so I won't take too long because I know I'm time, 15 minutes. So um, I've been homeless, I've been bankrupt, I've been, abandoned by my husband back in 
what, 1999. I raised three children. One I sent to a prestigious private college in um, South Carolina. She works for the U.S. Treasury here in D.C., been in the Virginia area about 11 years since she graduated. I lived here for three years, moved back to South Carolina to help my youngest son get through college and got diagnosed with lung cancer, then brought breast cancer nine months later. I coded it twice in the hospital. I was supposed to be standing here. I died. And when someone say, you, you can die if you're dead, you're dead. That's a lie. I died, and they brought me back. <laughs> that, that, uh, twice, twice. Not one time, but twice, twice. Um, I was told by family members that was my whole entire family, siblings, sisters, and brothers, most of them, all, all of them educated. They, all of them have their good college degrees. I didn't go to college, but I did finished school. And I took a lot of training and did a lot of studying in other areas. Um, that I would never be able to send my daughter to a prestigious college. Back then it was like $25,000 a year. Right now that would be $50,000 per year. So you do the math in your brain 15 years ago. So anyways, not only she when she graduated. Um, my son, my oldest, is an entrepreneur. Um, he's been an entrepreneur for 13 years. He's only 33 years old. Um, my husband abandoned us. We stayed in a hotel for three months. We was homeless. Um, when I moved out of the hotel, I didn't have a job. I prayed, stayed in my Bible. My kids had to catch the school bus from the hotel. I stayed in my Bible while they were at school. When I moved out the hotel, I got a townhouse with no job. The, the man said, I tell you what, if you bring me first month's rent deposit, I, you know, you can move in. I prayed for a job to be making at least $25 an hour at the time because that's what it took for me to send my daughter to college and raise my other two sons. I got a job making $25 an hour. Lasted five years at MCI World coming until they closed the doors. I stayed there until they closed the doors. After that, moved here in 2010, relocated, like I say, went back home. In 2015, I got diagnosed with the lung cancer, coded. November 2015, the week before Thanksgiving, they lost me, I think, about four minutes, brought me back, went to surgery February 2016, came out of surgery, supposed to have been two hours, it lasted 12 hours. Next morning, the specialist came to my room and he says, um, who are you? You awake? Who are you? And he looked up, he, said, he just walked out the room, he said, you got a higher power somewhere, by." So, but the thing of it is, my point is, when God's got control of your life, can't no doctor, no man, nobody, nowhere put nothing on it that you're not going to live, you're not going to make it. I was told I wasn't going to make it. Um, that was in 2016. I'm still here. I'm standing before you now. So I called it twice, you know. Um, that was in February of 2016. Then October 31st, 2016, I got diagnosed with breast cancer and went back to surgery twice in December 7th, I think it was like the 7th and then the 14th. Went back to surgery, coded again, made it. I'm still here, here. they had to bring me back. I coded, they lost me. They, brought my, they had to bring me back. Once they brought me back, I, it took about maybe nine months, maybe six months to get well from the breast cancer, nine months from the lung cancer. Um, zero income while I was going through it. My oldest son had to keep a roof over my head, he had his own bills. Um, that went on for about a year and a half. Um, I couldn't walk. All I could do was slide through the house, but I couldn't ask for him to leave his company because he had employees. He had his own house to come take care of me. So what I would do, I would just walk in the Word and pray. I started my nonprofit while I was sick. So if you guys want to, you can get some. Um, I have some pamphlets back there, some um, flyers back there on my table. But I started while I was sick in the house two hours a day. I remember the medicine wouldn't help me. I remember me saying, I cannot do this. I started the nonprofit. Everything I do, I believe in writing it on paper. I don't believe in just walking around and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm putting it ahead. Anything I'm going to do, I'm putting it on paper. I already knew I was going to do this 20 years ago, so I already had it on paper. I just had to add to it. Every time I thought I was done, something else happened. Cancer. Had to add to that. Now I'm back here in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. So now my biggest goal, and I prayed about it for two years while I was beating cancer, I said, where am I to be? And I remember volunteers for the volunteering for the shelters when I lived here before. And God laid it on my heart. He said, I came here in March of this year for my birthday, 
few of my friend girls, we flew in. And we came out of church that Sunday, and I said, this is where I'm supposed to be. And they're like, what you talking about? I said, you don't understand. I said, I've been praying about that this is where I'm supposed to be. So God laid it on my heart. He said, this is where you're supposed to be. So I ended up moving here in May of this year. So now I'm in transition, getting settled here so I can get all my furniture here, whatever. But the main thing, what I would say, I also was with First Financial Security, Shirley Lou. Ten, I knew Shirley Lou like 10 years ago. Wait a minute, let me see. Nine years ago. I knew Shirley Lou when she first started this thing, and it wasn't that I never believed her. I just had people in my head that introduced me to her was in my ear saying, that ain't gonna work. She ain't gonna be able to do that. That was one year, and then about three years later, she was like, and she flew to Greenville while I was dealing with the cancer, and we had her to fly in. She treated us like kings and queens, as usual. And she did a presentation that weekend, and she flew back, and then I came back to visit, and I went to her new office. When I went to her new office, I was like, oh my God, I let my code expire. I said, I'm sitting here playing, going to hit a time clock every day, and I just sit here and watch her become a freaking millionaire, and I'm sitting here broke. I watched her become a millionaire. I watched her become, I with my own two eyes, didn't nobody tell me, didn't nobody pick up the phone and say, you know this lady named Shirley Lou? I watched her become wealthy. I did. I, and I'm like, how can I sit there and let nine years go by? And I was right there by her side and I didn't move forward. So I, I rejoined, I connected back with her now. I re, had them to resubmit my code so it could you know, reactivate the code because I'll let all that go so I had to pay more money. But in the process, I was learning and I was going through something mentally for the good, not for the bad. So that was a good thing in a way because I was dealing with cancer in the process but all of it went through my brain. So at the same time, even though I say this, even though I went, that's why I call my story, it was necessary. It was necessary for me to go through everything that I went through. Because had I not went through what I went through, I would not be standing here. The reason why I'm standing here is because God kept me here because he got more for me to do. So if you're still here and you don't went through some humps and bumps, it's not by luck. <laughs> you're just blessed. And he got a mission. He wants you to finish your mission. And so a lot of people, they don't get that. They just, you know, they figure, you know, oh, well, I'm just still here. You know, I'm just, I don't know, it's just lucky. You know, the car hit me, but I'm just lucky. The car didn't kill me. But if we flipped 20 times and I went to surgery and I came out about 20, two, 24 weeks later, but I'm still here. A lot of people don't get it. I know that God kept me because I coded twice in the hospital. So now my vision is to actually reach out to single parents, shelters, churches here in the area, and push what, sh and, and praying, I know it ain't too late, to push first financial security, what Shirley Lewis doing because I have their network. I was crazy then because I was listening to somebody else in my ear, girl, you better keep your job, you better keep on doing that because what Shirley Lou doing ain't gonna work. Shirley Lou got the baddest office I done walked in and I know some multi-billionaires who got plenty of, 500 Fortune Company got some nicest offices. She got the most beautiful home that she just moved in that she welcomed me to when I first got here. And to me, that's a blessing. That ain't no luck. That is a blessing because I watched her struggle for nine years to get to that point. So I'm looking at if you did this in nine years and I'm still doing the same old thing I was doing for 20 years, then I need to come with you. So I say this to say this, I'm a living testimony I love people, I love to give, I have a big heart, and I know where I'm supposed to be. So if you know someone needs someone to speak at their church, their university, I mostly would love to speak with parents that has children, but if they don't, that's fine. Um, women's prisons or women's shelters, churches and universities, anywhere in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. That's it. Well, we couldn't be more motivated and, and glad you're still here, that's for sure. <laughs> Folks, I'm gonna bring up the woman who has helped make this so possible today, Tia Young. She is president of Women of Good Works and producer of Sage Solutions, GTM LLC. Tia.
thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just cannot go home unless I give out some thanks uh, to just about everybody in this room for supporting me uh, forever. I can just go down the list. Maggie, I just recently met you. And for you to be willing, I mean, I know how busy you are. I know there's a demand out there for you. And for you to take the time to come and support me, I'm grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, Sharon Alvarez, um, in the back, I met Sharon, gosh, it's been, what, Sharon, maybe 20 years ago, almost. Um, I had started, I had worked on Capitol Hill for almost 28 years. And I had a, a, a hiatus, and then I got a call from the Department of Agriculture to come and work uh, there for the secretary, Secretary Dan Glickman. And uh, stayed with him for a couple of years, and um, then got a promotion to Natural Resources Conservation Service. And the, 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 the guy that was my boss knew that I didn't know anything about the federal government. And he knew that, you know, in that, that I needed somebody that would have my back because I just didn't know the culture. I mean, agriculture has been called the last plantation, just to be honest with you. That's what it was called back 20 years ago. So um, Pearlie went all the way to North Carolina and found an executive assistant for me to come and have my back. And she had my back for me way back then. I would not have made it through that. I mean, I had the, the skill to be able to know what to do here on the Hill and that, but I didn't know that culture. And she had my back. So Sharon, thank you so much. She's come from North Carolina to come here to be with me today. And I thank you so much. Um, Tanisha Prince is the manager of the Tyson's Corner store. And I've known her for what, a couple of years that you've been here about a couple of years, but I mean, immediately, I mean, she was, she was there for me. And we've had a, a partnership with Microsoft. We've actually had the partnership for about four years. But for the past two years, we've been able to do more, uh, more good and more things for people in the community under her leadership. Tanisha, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And she brought her husband. Uh, with her, and this is the first time I've met you, but I, listen, I want to talk to you after <laughs> this is over with. <laughs> and then I have some new friends that I just recently met, and it feels like we have bonded together as one, and that's Ruth and Dr. Williams. We just, I, it's just amazing. Um, I've been with them a couple of times, and now they, they're here supporting me, and I'm grateful to you both. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, Pamela Mannion, I have to say something about the federal government. They have my back this time because I reached out to, I can't tell you how many corporate organizations uh, to be here to help with sponsoring this. And all of them said, well, Tia, you know, we, we need at least five months you know, before we can, uh, you know, really put everything together because we got to go here and we got to go there and get approval. And I, I said, I said, well, Lord, what am I going to do? He said, well, do what you know. You know, you worked on the Hill for 28 years. Call the congressional liaisons and have them get in contact. And that's what I did. And each of the women that I called immediately, it was like a connection. Uh, when, I, when I called them, I called um, uh, SBA. They were here for me. Veterans Affairs, they were here for me. I've never met these two ladies before, but they were here for me. Uh, Tanya in the back, they, she was here for me. Um, and I'm just grateful. I am really grateful to you. I thank you so much. Lakeisha and Talisha, I just met them about, what, 60 days ago at an event. And they touched my heart there. And my, actually, was at Microsoft where we met. Touched my heart, and you guys are here for me today. I appreciate that. Malika, I love you. You know, <laughs> it's wonderful. And then I saved the last for not... I mean, they the, say last, not least, but last. Um, Naya in the back, I knew her when she was in her mommy. Her mommy is sitting right next to her. I knew her before she was born. And to see her come up. Dion, I, I've known her since she was five years old. 
and just to see all that the Lord has done for her in her life and how she is pushing forward no matter what, it touches my heart. You know, thank you so much. Shirley Lou, 10 years ago, met her. Everything I've ever done, she's always supported me. Yeti Isatu supported me, always. I wish you all God's blessings as we continue our journey. And one other thing, my new podcast has just started. You can get it, get it down from SoundCloud right now. And it is called Sharing the Journey because we have done that today. We have all shared our journeys and there's so much more to come. My first show is up and it is with the youngest person who walked from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in the 1965 Voting Rights March. And her name is Linda Blackman Lowry. She has a book out called Turning 15 on the Road to Freedom. Listen to her story and see how much of it parallels what is going on today. Once again, as I started the day, we must be registered to vote and go vote, okay? Our lives depend on this vote in 2020. And start with your local level and go up from there. There's, it's not too late. If you're standing here, then it is not too late for you to be part of the solution, not the problem. Mm -hmm.